So hello. Um, indeed, I'm going to talk, well, let's first focus on the mitigating information leakage vulnerabilities, but first, um, I would like to point out the beautiful legal disclaimer from my employer, Intel, who'd like to make it clear they have nothing to do with this work whatsoever. I did this work at VUSEC, my previous employer, um, together with Eric and Cristiano. So, the dream. I'm going to first talk about the dream. It's kind of what we would like in a perfect world. So I'm a systems security researcher, and so when I talk about information leakage vulnerabilities, I mean at you know, systems level. So we're not talking about high-level privacy type stuff. We're talking about really like spatial vulnerabilities. So you know, this is you have an out-of-bounds read, and temporal vulnerabilities. You might have a use after free. You might be reading uninitialized memory that was previously used for something else. And also, we're going to talk about you know, architectural vulnerabilities. These are kind of your traditional, non-speculative vulnerabilities. And this is, these are things like you, know, you have a missing bounds check. But it's 2022, so we're also going to try and take into account, in this mitigation, speculative vulnerabilities. For example, the Spectre um, bounds check, where you know, your bounds check is there. You don't have a software bug, but the processor will helpfully speculate right past your check and still, maybe an attacker can use side channels to leak data. So this is the dream. You know, this is maybe a, a dream I share with many other people, with many other previous researchers. And the problem is always that we want low overhead. You know, we want this to be practical in, um, want this to be practical enough that you will all deploy it, right? We want that magical 10% number that all of viewers want to see. So you know, let's throw away the dream and let's move on to the plan. So the plan is that we're not going to try mitigating all of this. What we're going to do is we're going to try splitting things up by type. You know, and what do I mean by type? Well, you know, I'm a researcher. I want to sell my paper. I'm just going to sell. You can define this as however you want. We'll get back to that in a minute. But in this example, let's say you have some network buffers for your I.O. code, and you have your private cryptographic keys. Right? Your private cryptographic keys should not be ending up in your network buffer. These should definitely be isolated. Okay, and actually we want fine-grained isolation of all the types you want. So no matter how you're gonna define your types, you want to be able to have this fine-grained isolation, no kind of splitting into secret, non-secret. And so that's kind of one of the ways we're gonna make our dream become reality. And the other thing is that we're gonna rely on the compiler. And we're gonna try using compiler magic to keep pointers in one of these types. We're gonna call the regions where we put one type of data an arena. So here we have one arena for our temporary network buffers and one arena, one arena for our private keys. And so let's say we have a pointer that's pointing into the network socket, into this temporary socket. And you know, there's a vulnerability that lets you read out of bounds, missing check. And so maybe an attacker can use this to read out of bounds within this type of data, within the temporary buffers. And we're gonna say that's okay. You know, we're gonna completely betray our dream and just say, yeah, it's the same type of data, so we're just not gonna cover it in the interest of practicality. On the other hand, we're gonna say that you should not be able to take a pointer that's pointing into these network buffers and use them to point, to read out of bounds and read private keys, another type of data, right? And so, like, compiler magic. So the how, the answer is just magic and we move on. No, so we have three kind of pieces here. So the first piece, is an allocator that actually allocates things in arenas. And we're gonna organize the address space in a very careful way. We're gonna have four gigabyte arenas. And so the idea is between each of these four gigabyte arenas, and each of these arenas has one type of data, we're gonna put unmapped guard zones. And those unmapped guard zones are also gonna be four gigabytes. This is also gonna be aligned. And one key point here is that a pointer that's pointing into one of these arenas, so maybe this arena contains your network buffers, you can go up to four gigabytes in either direction, and you'll either stay in the same arena, or you'll hit unmapped memory. So you can move four gigabytes in any direction from a pointer, and if you dereference it, you're either gonna get the same type of data, or you're gonna get a fault. The second step is we're gonna need some way to actually allocate different types of data into different arenas. And you can do that, it's this previous work which we lean heavily on in the evaluation called type after type. There's also annotations, there's a bunch of other techniques. But we're just gonna leave it high level here. We just use some way to allocate different types. And then we have the actual compiler instrumentation. 
And kind of the key point of the puzzle here is we don't allocate, we don't try instrumenting the loads and stores. We try instrumenting the pointer arithmetic. And so we try and make sure that when you do a pointer arithmetic, there's no way for you to get a pointer from one type of data to another type of data. So the trick here is you have what we call valid, safe, and unsafe pointers. So there's three classifications of pointers which we use. So a valid pointer is one that is pointing at the intended arena. So you have a pointer that's meant to point into your buffers or your keys. That pointer is, a valid pointer means that one is still pointing at that arena into this four gigabyte chunk. You can move up to four gigabytes in both directions, and that will get you a safe pointer. It's a pointer that you can dereference. Maybe it'll segfault, but it's not gonna let, if you dereference this, you're not gonna be able to read data that belongs, that it is of a different type. And then you have an unsafe pointer, which it may not point into another arena, but an unsafe pointer is one where we can't prove that it's pointing into either the arena or the guard zones next to it. So an unsafe pointer might be pointing somewhere else. And what we do is we insert instrumentation to do what we call masking. Masking being we take one of these safe pointers or unsafe pointers and we turn it back into a valid pointer that's pointing at the intended type for that pointer. And because we're instrumenting pointer arithmetic, what we can do is we can just kind of trace back, you know, what was the arithmetic based on in the first place. And we just can make sure that it has the same type, it's pointing at the same arena as that pointer that was the basis for our pointer arithmetic. So the way masking works is, you know, we want low overheads. We want this to be super cheap. We want a super cheap way to take a pointer and make sure it's pointing at the arena we want. And the trick is that because we have these aligned four gigabyte regions, then we can say the lower 32 bits, they're the offset into an arena, and the upper 32 bits, they identify the arena. So basically, they're kind of a type identifier. And so we can say that, let's add you know, a pretty large value, but something that's still within four gigabytes. And that gets us a safe pointer. It might still point within the same arena, or it might point into your guard zone. This is a safe pointer. You can dereference it. It's fine. The upper bits changed in this example, but we don't care. We don't have to apply masking here. But the interesting case is where you have an unsafe pointer. So let's add another large value. We're no longer within four gigabytes, or certainly not provably so. And so how do you turn this pointer back into a pointer that points into the original arena? And we just look back to the original valid pointer, and we just take the upper 32 bits of the pointer and just stomp over them, and we preserve the lower 32 bits. And it turns out that on x86, for example, you can do this with two ZOR operations. So it's actually super cheap to do in practice. And so you know, what does this let us do? Why is this interesting? Why is this kind of a delta? of our previous work. Again, we're going, and the trick is we're going for the fine grained isolation and the high performance. So here's an example of why I at least think this is really valuable trick. And we have an example. So one of the things that we require is that all of the pointer arguments to a function, they have to be valid pointers. When you pass an argument to a function, you have to have masked it first if you can't prove it was already a valid pointer. So you can assume that all of your pointers are valid. Or we also require that all of the pointers stored in memory are valid. Because we have no way of tracking whether a pointer that we just read from memory is valid or not. So we just mandate, if you store a pointer to memory, if you pass a pointer as an argument, all of the pointers that kind of escape a local function boundary, they have to be valid. And so here we have a loop, and it's just basically you take a valid pointer, you, you add one, you dereference it, you add one, you dereference it. And you know you can pass a huge size. Size can be 64 bits, so you can read way out of bounds with this. But you can only do it step by step. So you know you have your pointer maybe all the way at the end of an arena, and then you read one, and then you read another one. But then at this point, this is going to fault. You're going to try dereferencing something that's in a guard zone, and it's going to fault. So actually, you don't have to add any instrumentation here. We don't need to do any masking because every time you read from a pointer that we know is within four gigabytes, it's either going to be um, a valid pointer, it's gonna be pointing into the original arena, and we can say, aha, this is a valid pointer because it didn't fault, or it's gonna be pointing into unmapped memory, unmapped memory, and it will fault, and then we don't care anymore. The problem comes when we remember that, uh-oh, we put speculation in our threat model, and speculation doesn't really care 
um, that you might fall on a speculative path, right? And uh, you, know, you might get another read speculatively around the next loop and another read. So in this example, the thing is that no matter how fancy your processor is, it's never going to manage to speculate far enough to get to the other arena. We're adding one byte at a time. You're not going to speculate four gigabytes of loop ahead. So in this example, also speculatively, we don't have to instrument anything. And one of the reasons that this technique works so well is that we get away without having to instrument this kind of loop whatsoever. Of course, the problem comes that, you know, what if you change the stride to four gigabytes? It's like, okay, we have a pointer at the end of the arena, and we add four gigabytes, and it's going to fault. But then if you include speculation, then yeah, you know, your next read is going to be in the next arena, maybe corresponding to a different type. And at that point, you might well have a problem if an attacker has a way to disclose this via a side channel or this kind of thing. So in that case, we would have to actually mask the pointer. But in practice, you don't have four gigabyte strides in real world code. The problem, of course, is that this loop might not actually dereference the pointer every time. And if you can't prove that these strides are going to actually, that you are going to actually have a pointer dereference without the pointer getting far enough that you can either architecturally or speculatively um, get, end up with a fault, then you, know, you are going to have to mask. But OK, so this is kind of the very high level view. Please read the paper for a rather more um, detailed analysis of how this works and why it's safe. But then how do you actually implement this? So I mean, we implemented using NLVM. We have a compiler pass. We have an allocator and so forth. Um, and those of you familiar will just say kind of, uh, you know, you just, add in, you just instrument the get element pointer instructions. And those of you more familiar with things like ugly gaps and this kind of thing will realize, no, there's no way that's going to work. Um, we're just going to call it magic. Does that work? You know, point of provenance, solve problem. You know, uh, no, not so much after all. There are turned out to be all kinds of corner cases. For example, you might have the pointers might be instructs or unions, and that's a big killer. You know, you have a union, you add something to it. Wait, do we need to mask this or not? What's the type of this? C code is full of undefined behavior, especially spec CPU is full of undefined behavior that you can't touch. And you might have allocations that are bigger than four gigabytes. You might have all kinds of other problems. And uh, you know, we discuss this in the paper. We find solutions. But the most important bit for me is, you know, th does it work? You know, I mean, there are all kinds of obstacles which you can think of and you run across if you try and implement this. But the answer is yes. I mean, most importantly, we actually managed to mitigate vulnerabilities. So we took a, a sample of CVEs. We also mitigate the specter uh, bounce check and also actually some other specter vulnerabilities from Google's safe side suite. Um, and also, it actually runs a whole bunch of software, not only CPU 2017 and 2006 and 2000, but also a stack where we combine Nginx, OpenSSL, Mozilla, and some other libraries with some patches. You know, let's be honest here. There is undefined behavior here. There are cases where the compiler magic is just not able to automatically identify this. But we discussed in the paper actually a pretty surprisingly low number of patches is required for this to work. And you know, OK, we wanted the low overhead. Do we manage it? Well, kind of the, the worst case I could come up with in Nginx. So this is Nginx, HTTPS requests, really tiny requests, lots of them on a fiber network interface. And kind of the worst case overhead is about 8.4%. It's less than 10%. It's not great. Um, the, the real troublemaker is Polbench in CPU 2017, where I, we have real problems with trying to just reason about some of this arithmetic in deeply inlined functions where it's just difficult to keep track of what's going on from a compiler perspective. The runtime for the older version of spec is much more reasonable. Um, I mean, this is in terms of, run, of actual runtime. There's also, you can see in the paper, it's some discussion of the memory overhead of this arena allocation, but it kind of ends up being about 10%. Um, and a lot of this is really kind of the terrible worst cases. Um, so there's a prototype on GitHub, thanks to a couple of my colleagues who actually made it work inside the Docker. Um, kind of my takeaways from this work are that, you know, point of provenance is tricky. Um, there's some great work written on this, the, the Cerberus paper. Um, 
one big problem we have is that we're trying to include speculation here. Uh, for example, LLVM scale evolution just doesn't, there's no way for it to consider this. You just, you'll say, what's the, diff, what's the maximum distance between this pointer and this pointer? And it'll say, well, you know, you have a bounds check here, so, you know, your maximum distance is four bytes. And it doesn't take into account that under speculation, you know, that branch may not necessarily actually provide you any guarantees. And so for this to work well, I think compilers really need better static analysis support for trying to reason under speculation. And finally, kind of I glossed over the whole type thing. We do have actually pretty fine-grained types. But for example, in a web server, you probably actually want your types to be more like different users' data, for example, rather than actual C-level types, and then you really kind of need some manual intervention. But having said all of that, it works pretty well. It's low overhead. Um, I'm kind of amazed that it, it actually worked out, but it seems like much more promising to me than a lot of the previous work that's been doing kind of similar bits and bobs. So thank you, and I'd love to hear questions. So we have time for some questions. If you have questions, please walk up to the microphone. Or if you have questions at home, please type them in the Q&A box. Um, okay. So um, first off, uh, what you talk about is specifically for a um, 64-bit architecture, right? So have you experimented with smaller architectures, smaller arena sizes, et cetera? I have not. So it's, uh, it's something that you it kind of relies on the 64-bit address space. So if you mean kind of microprocessors, it's going to be way less practical, I feel. A, a lot of the win here is really that it's so cheap to replace the 32-bit pointers. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's things like if you had dedicated processor features, like memory tagging and this kind of thing, I think you could actually use that in some, in some incarnations to try and implement something similar, even without this kind of memory layer. I see. And, and, and one more quick thing. On your slide number 12, something called eQuake was actually faster. How did that happen? I, so the, one of the, um, the problems with this kind of, kind of deeply invasive um, instrumentation is that sometimes you just make the compiler do something completely different in the code generation stage. And it's deeply frustrating because you change one thing, and suddenly you have um, weird results like this. So magic. Um, but I have no idea. And you change some configuration options and different benchmarks will gain. So. Thank you. Great Thank work, you. by the way. If I may offer an educated guess to that last question, um, probably changing instruction alignment with respect to the iCache. And you get a better iCache hit rate by accident. <laughs> No, exactly. So one of the, the things I glossed over here as well is the fact that um, we cover with the heap and the stack and other allocations. And that means also that you alloc we allocate on different stacks, so, um, something yeah. we kind of hacked up based on type after type. Right. And that also means that you change one thing. It's like, uh oh, um, your data cache is completely different. Yeah. You're, you're, you're also, yes. Yeah. You're, but yeah, I think iCache is a, is a really good guess for why you tend to see or, these weird impacts. Sorry, I didn't understand you were also changing the stacks. Dcache behavior is also a, an excellent guess in that case. Question I want to ask, very interesting work. Have you considered any other programming languages, particular languages that are typically garbage collected? I mean, it would be a different paper. I just wondered if you had any thoughts to share. Uh, not really. So one, uh, one obvious question that I ask is why not web browsers? Um, you know, why not try defending JavaScript with this? And it turns out that, for example, Chrome, I think, already has partition malloc. It already tries to kind of divide up um, allocations into kind of arena-type things. So I think certainly for some languages, it wouldn't be that much of a delta. But on the other hand, this kind of, if you want pooled allocations, where you're really trying high efficiency allocations and you're trying to squeeze it all into a pool, which I think a lot of garbage collected languages do, and actually I think some of the spec match marks do, um, it's tricky. It's going to be quite different, but it would be interesting to see. We should talk offline. Right? Okay, maybe one more quick question while the next speaker sets up. Uh, so I was wondering how fine-grained can you make this? Uh, is there an overhead associated with creating a single arena, and how many arenas can you have in practice, or how many did you have in your experiments, for example? So I think in my experiments, it was mostly less than a 1,000. You definitely do have a limit. I will refer you to the paper because I'm not going to try doing math in my head. 
Um, but it's in the thousands. It's in the tens of thousands, but there's definitely a limit there. And again, otherwise you'd have to kind of shrink your arenas and stuff. So yeah, the fine-grained is nice, but there is a limit, unfortunately. All right, let's thank the speaker again.